Michelle Green is here. <laughs> there you go. All right. Uh, so if you need a handout, uh, just lift your hand. There's a couple of little hidden things in there. I know we got lost in the basket this morning. Oh, yeah. Oh, here they are. There he is. Okay. I thought maybe the coffee machine swallowed you up. <laughs> Let me open in prayer. Father in heaven, as we turn to your word and the authority of your word, we pray that we will understand. We pray that we will begin to really discern from it what your word says about itself. And from that comes great confidence and understanding that the word of God that is written is authoritative, it is life, it will change the chapter for all of us. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would not only form us, Okay, so if you, did, if you need one, just lift up your hand, and uh, there are five for uh, one of them is five dollars. If you get two, if you get two for ten, I guess that's the deal. <laughs> okay, this is this is our theme verse for this section right here, and you know I memorized it in the um, Old King James, but however you want to memorize it. Uh, in whatever version you memorize, I really encourage you to memorize scriptures about Scripture because when you're discouraged, when you're frustrated, when you're not sure what to do, uh, I always turn to God's Word. And there's always a phrase that will jump out or something in the middle of the text that I never saw before. How, you know, it's amazing. How many times have you read the Bible and all of a sudden, I never saw that before? And, you know, here I've been doing this for years and years and have all kinds of degrees and junk like that. And there's stuff that I reference all the time. So it's never an answer. It's always scripture. Here's the scripture for all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching. That means to give instruction, to reprove. That means to correct and almost a similar word to it, correction and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped unto every good work. So we're going to look today at what the scripture says about itself. We looked last time about what the scripture says about not itself, but historically how it's been looked at. And we started with one organization, Roman Catholicism, and kind of how they viewed Scripture. This is last week. We didn't finish the last page or two. So if you don't have that, I didn't bring any extra with that. I apologize, but I can get that to you. And this Roman Catholicism holds to what's called solo ecclesia, which ecclesia uh, is the word for church. So solo means church only. So they have a dual source of authority when it comes to God's word, and that is God's word and tradition. And whatever the church says that they hold to or how they interpret it, they are the masters of it. So that's why in a Roman Catholic church, you, you know, I, I haven't been there in a long time, but I don't ever recall seeing any pew Bibles, ever seeing anything in here where you could sit down and talk with God's word and read it. And the reason you do it is because they believe they properly interpret Scripture. And even if you take a class in confirmation, how many of you went through confirmation in the Roman Catholic Church and went through all those steps? Uh, did, did, they, did they use uh, the Bible or did they use uh, an instruction manual? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. They do all kinds of stuff like that and they'll use the, the catechize you and teach you. Now, in between the two of them, there's a division in the church between the East and the West. Roman Catholicism was West. They spread it out south to the East. And then Eastern Orthodox is the Eastern Orthodox Church. And they look at Scripture as the primary tool, but still it's the church that interprets it. So historically, these people would look at creeds. They would look at the church councils, for which there were seven of them. Uh, and just to show you how unfamiliar we are with 
to a church for counseling. I was asked to write a paper in school on one of the church councils. So I got a book called The Creeds of Christendom. I went down to Biola uh, University down there in Chicago. And they said, oh, well, check this book out. That's going to give you a good grounding. So I checked it out. And um, I get home in the library. And you know how you have that little green card? And I think they do that in Biola. But it's very similar. It says, oh, this is the last book that came out. But the last guy to check it out was in 1965. And his name was John MacArthur. <laughs> John was a Calvinist school I was in, and I just thought it was so funny that here I am some 20, 30 years later, and, and this is the last time that book was checked out, so not a very popular one. So what they do is they look at the Christian creeds that have taken place over the years, and they use that to interpret God's word. They use that to give us understanding. So by the time you get to the Second Church Council, they have iconography. And if you're not familiar with iconography, you can you can generate an icon. Are you familiar with what an icon is? An icon is a physical representation of something spiritual. And so whether that be a painting of Mary, whether it be a statue, whether it be uh, some artistic thing that was supposed to be drawn to help you see. Because remember, uh, back, in, you know, if you can remember a thousand years ago, um, there, there was not a lot of people who could read the Bible. Most people were just simply silent. And so they tried to convey truth through objects, paintings, things like this. Well, the Second Church Council not only received those, but the Second Church Council said it's appropriate to venerate those, which means if you see a picture of a saint, you bow down and say, thank you. If you pray to the saint and that saint gives intercession to you in Jesus, and uh, we need to be careful here because you get on the Roman Catholics because they say they worship Mary. And the Roman Catholics say, no, we don't worship Mary. We venerate Mary. We worship only God, but we venerate Mary. And at, at times I fail to see that in the church because I see people praying in the midst of troubles and difficulties or hardships and they pray, you know, whatever prayer it is that they're praying for Mary. I remember the first time that I saw The Passion of the Christ. Any of you seen that movie? I think they're going to be doing another one. The sequel is coming out soon, so that should be interesting. Um, but if you ever do The Passion of the Christ and see it, I got a chance to see it at somebody's house. It's a very rich person who lives in Argentina. Some of you know who that story is. You need, you need a handout, guys? Yeah, let me get you a couple of handouts. Check them out. Check them here. It, it'll take me a week to get there, but you'll get there. Don't worry about it. I'm just teasing. He's just, I'm just teasing. Me, me and Chuck joked around because I, I need a knee replacement, and so does he. So we're, we're, we're waiting for the buy one, get one free. And then after that, it's just a battle of life. So I was watching this uh, Passion of the Christ, and it hadn't been released yet, and it hadn't even been digitized yet. So it was on regular film, and they hadn't finished all the coloring. So Kim Khadijah's eyes are, are still blue, you know, but <laughs> she knows she's in it, and it wasn't blonde-haired, blue eyes. But at the end of the movie, which is very compelling, is at the very end of it, I didn't realize I was in a full green tank. And I think I was the only dramatic one there. And everybody stops, and people are crying. It's a very moving film. And then in silence. Everybody is unison, Hail Mary, full of grace. That is the passion of the Christ. And, and on and on and on and on. But I realized that, hey, this is a situation where they, this is their mother praying to them and responding. And they're trying to explain to them, hey, you, you do believe this. You have the full grace. You have the Holy Spirit who not only prays for you, you, he says, ask whatever you wish in my name. And by the way, my name. Jesus, I'm asking you for a million dollars in my name. It means in my name means according to his will. We're asking according to his will in my name. So Eastern Orthodoxy is different than Roman Catholicism. Now, the early church was right here. And, and why? Well, simply because the totality of Scripture had not yet been fully completed and written. So they relied upon the testimony of the prophets within the church who would speak and give them revelation from God's word. And so this is the regular faith or the rule of faith, but as the word of God became complete, right? Book 
end of Revelation, the very last verse. Can anybody tell me what that verse is? Come, Lord Jesus, come. But before that, it says, uh, anybody who takes away from the words of this book, um, the book of prophecy, God, I thought I had the verse written down, but God shall take away his part of the tree of life from the holy city. Uh, what's that written in this book? So, again, we give it a warning. Scripture is now sealed up. Prophecy is done. So if somebody comes to you and says, I've got a word from the Lord, it, it better line up with this verse right here. Because if it doesn't, it, we've got a mystery going on, right? We've got a riddle going on. So be very careful about that. So what we believe, and I find myself in this camp right here, is sola scriptura, right here. This is where most people fall. We believe in scripture, sola scriptura, meaning God's word, God's word alone. But we do take into account uh, historical understanding and the development and understanding of various forms of what we would call a church council, much like the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Church, but we judge the council by God's word. So if it doesn't line up with God's word, then we don't have a church here, where Eastern Orthodoxy would say it's the equivalent of God's word. Solo scriptura is different than this. This is sola, this is solo. This would say scripture alone, forget the history. Not even going to get into that. And so they, like in many independent churches, they will preach from the Bible, but they'll have, they won't do any historical theology. But they will study something new in God's word, and it's got to do with the Lord in God's word and God's word alone. Only to find out that, you know what, there's not a whole lot of truth that we haven't discovered in God's word. All we do is just kind of clarify and let it ride on its own. So understand this has a high view of scripture, but this has a supreme view of tradition. It approaches it in this way, and this has a supreme view of scripture and a low view of tradition. It kind of fall right here along with the Reformed Pentecostal Church and their different practices. So um, again, that gets into the church. Here's where the denominations fall, various denominations. So uh, solo scriptura here, you have two Baptist, two independent churches, and then two going the other direction would be more Presbyterian because Presbyterians sometimes will look at the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is a good confession of faith. Um, and we even as Baptists look at the 1689 Confession of Faith, another good example of a great expression of faith. But we realize that even these expressions of faith are not without error. We realize that there are mistakes in there. For instance, like the 1689 Confession of Faith, the Texans would have you believe that the Pope is the Antichrist. <laughs> they figured that, well, wait a minute, he's not, yeah. So, you know, when you talk about the Antichrist, the probably the way we ought to phrase it is the Antichrist, plural. Because John says that there are many antichrists, and antichrist is even one. And so when we look at church history, and we look at an understanding of the nature of antichrist, here John writes, and he says the antichrist is now, but he also says antichrist is coming. And he can be referring to 70 AD, uh, when Nero was there, or he could refer to another historical figure, and then the Roman Empire falls. That doesn't mean that Antichrist is gone. Antichrist is still present in the world. And then another tyrant will come to power who has all the characteristics of Antichrist. And this formula continues to go throughout history until we come to the place when the actual Antichrist is going to be revealed. So, you know, during World War II, a lot of people said, you know, Hitler was the Antichrist. Well, he certainly did the work of the Antichrist, didn't he? He stood against God. He stood against God's uh, people. He caused war for it. Millions of people died. But throughout history, there's been historical figures like this. And that's why John says he was, right, Antichrist, or he, he, he 
says who he is, and then he says, which is in uh, Revelation 17, he is who he is not, but then he will be. So he is, that's when he shows up on the scene, he is not. Historically, after the world gets everything back in control, I mean, after World War I, they said it was the war to end all wars. I mean, what happened just 20, 30 years later? World War II. And then that was going to end all the wars. And so there was a time of peace. And then right back to a time of, you know, the Cold War was going to end. And so he is, that's who's in the world now. Then there's going to be seasons when he is not. And then he will be. Of course, this is takeoff on the character of our Lord Jesus Christ who was, who is, and who is to come. And so you can see that parallelism with the Sabbath. So I don't know what traditions you come from or what background you come from, but uh, that, and this can vary from independent churches a lot. So so don't, un- don't think for a moment that because you grew up Presbyterian or Methodist that on this chart, that's what they believe. That's what their main denomination believes, but it doesn't mean that that's what you have to be as a Christian. There, there, there can be a lot of variance. And your denominationalism is kind of younger than your history. I know that now. But it used to be denominations, you know, held to distinctives that separated everybody. And then I think as we've grown theologically, communication has has expanded and we've been able to understand a lot more and there's a lot more unity within the church. Still, that doesn't mean the church is who God is. There's a lot of heresy in there too. We've got today the big thing is what's called the Orthodox faith and I was stopped in heaven by, so I Googled online and Joel Olstein is going to give an Easter morning message and the, the Easter morning message is not about the resurrection of Jesus but it's about the things in your life that you need to know for God. So if, if, you, if, you, if you had a dream, if you had a hope, if you had some expectation that uh, you were going to be a millionaire, well, Easter Sunday is all about the resurrection of your Jesus. And uh, so that's what he's going to be teaching about. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what you get when you get help well taught for doctrine and et cetera. Um, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so I'm going to conclude this section. Are there any questions? You all understand it perfectly, right? Okay, good. All right, so now let's go to the doctrine of the Word of God, the authority and inerrancy of God's Word. How do we know that the Bible is God's Word, right? Are there any errors in the Bible? Any mistakes in the Bible, right? We need to understand that because there are those who hold that there are mistakes in the Bible. I want to give you this. The authority of Scripture means this. This is a definition of what we mean by the authority. That all the words in Scripture are God's words in such a way that to disbelieve or disobey any word of Scripture is to disbelieve or disobey God. That's pretty solid, isn't it? So you have the instruction manual in front of you. And here is sins of commission and sins of omission. Sins of commission are the things the Bible says don't do and you do. Sins of omission are the things the Bible says that you're supposed to do, but what? You don't do. So we sin either way. Now, what does the Bible teach about itself? Well, there are four things you have listed there, right? You have the authority of Scripture, the clarity of Scripture, the necessity of Scripture, and the sufficiency of Scripture. So over the years, what's been challenging is the authority of Scripture, number one. The clarity of Scripture is also one of those contentions, I think, in this church. Uh, And then the necessity of Scripture coupled with the sufficiency of Scripture. So what we're saying is this book, the Word of God, is sufficient It provides all the needs and all the things that we have to have in order to live a godly Christian life. Now, it doesn't record everything that is true, but it records everything that is true for you to live a good Christian life. Like, for instance, the Bible doesn't say anything about what your blood pressure is. Well, it's not written for that. Right? Now, doctors
kemm tinbidu tmur f'kwart ta' żmien minn kif ikollok il-ħajja normali dan tgħaddew għal żewġ ġimgħat u kien jużi dawn il-lum li għaddew xi ħolġ borajl sew ta' kajf bond għal għaddew għal għaddew ta' kbir ġewġ amerikani ċeni sew tagħtu l-ġimgħat għal ta' għal 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 Constitution and Revolution is not there on the back of the sky in the sky. How do we know this is God's word? Well, this is what the Bible claims for itself. The Bible often uses phrases like what? Like it says, the Lord, it says in Psalm 119. So when it says, thus says the Lord, and it appears, by the way, hundreds of times in the Old Testament, I couldn't list them all, but if you have a concordance that you can go at home and look at, thus says the Lord, you're going to see hundreds of references to the Bible. So it's pretty clear that when you start asking yourself the question, what is scripture and what is authoritative, when it says, thus says the Lord, and then it spells it out, that that part at least is from God, isn't it? Because it says, thus says the Lord. And it's kind of like you liken it to people like a king. Uh, when a king would say something, he didn't get a chance to argue with the king or make his case. This is essentially what the king is saying. So therefore, when prophets, even prophets say, thus saith the Lord, they're claiming to be messengers from the sovereign king of Israel, namely God himself. And they're claiming that their words are the absolute authoritative words of God. And they're saying that these are essentially God's authoritative words. And when a prophet spoke in God's name, in this way, every word he spoke had to come from God or he would do what? False prophet. Yeah, and what was, the, what was the verdict of the false prophet? Death. How many of you have ever had somebody come to you and say, I have a word from the Lord, come to this meeting and I'm going to tell you what the Lord has to say. Yeah, I, I need the illustration of the guy sitting there with the pastor and the reverend and the priest and everything the story of his wife and got pregnant with their first kid and the child was born in utero and the doctor was like the third child and he said every time I get up to preach he said I have a word from the Lord and he said just to hear the word from the Lord so first of all it was the doctor that was wrong second of all it was the word from the Lord so I guess it's the doctor that's wrong and I guess it's the priest that's wrong also what else he says but the girl So his wife did see a prophet of God, and she brought her son to the temple. And the child did not come to the temple. In fact, the child went to the city. Everything else that she said was true. Now, what did she say was true? The child went to God, and God said, yeah, that's true. Now, if you'd done that for a friend, you'd have done that for many people. So this is the kind of stuff that could be used to impose teaching on God's people. Other people think that it's ridiculous. Nothing to do with God. How many prophets out there prophesied for Trump to win? I mean, I listen to all these people, all these different talk show hosts out there saying, saying, oh, he's going to win, he's going to win, he's going to win. Everybody, I, the Lord's prophesied, the Lord's told me. And I'm like, who have you read from? Do you have the Bible in front of you? Yeah, she is. Yeah, she did go to Peter. Yeah, I think she had the Bible with her. So she basically said that he's going to win. And then, of course, he doesn't win. And then their comeback is, no, he really won, but he has actually been stolen. Well, then how come your prophecy wasn't Trump is going to win the election, but it's going to be stolen and nobody will know about it? That would have been prophetic, according to the Reverend and the Lady No. So, you know, at least if you get a big enough pile of stuff from one person, you get it from the Lord. So that you've got to keep your mouth shut. So in your Old Testament, yeah, you have, a, you have prophets in your Old Testament who claim the authority of the Word of God, and yet you can't trust their words. They are essentially prophets. And I would like...
how can you get this right? You need to be teaching and one capital T. You need to bless them and the Lord and to give it without measure. And then a small t. comes across more as what I would say is an encouragement to you. So I would say that if, if somebody is really discouraged and somebody is frustrated and somebody is going through a difficult time right now, I might come to the person and put my hand on their shoulder and, and just say, hey, remember what God did for you. Paul was a man of God. And if you love him, you are going to love him. It doesn't say all the time. It might say it once, but it does say all the time. Encourage that brother, and that would be a small T of taking God's word and applying it in a prophetic and living fashion. This prophet is a prophet who received exactly word for word from God what he spoke on our behalf. This kind of prophet is unique. You don't have that ability anymore. You have people who are free to make their own little words and little statements and little things that they want to put. And and there's a, there's a lot of arguments about gift of prophecy and a lot of people have uncertainty about it and they're not sure what I think it's a gift of scripture and it's not as clear as they would like it but I think it's just what it says on the tag and that's kind of how I come to it okay so thus says the Lord that spoke through the prophets and other instances in the Old Testament the words the prophets spoke can be referred to as the very words of God so therefore we're saying here that to disbelieve or disobey angry language is to resist the voice of the Lord your God. But don't you do that in church? Because you're wrong. How, how many of you have ever been confronted by a church that is silent on this issue? About something that you just can't imagine them saying to you. You're not really sure what's going to happen. And you feel like the boss is going to be knocked out and you're going to be God doing? We've got judge come on us. This is going to be something that happens to the Lord's people. So God says to us in Revelation, don't worry about it. You're wasting your time. None of it's going to have any consequence. And we as a mixture look for two things in this. We look for the significance of our actions. We look for the meaning of our actions. And the second thing we look for is security. I want to be secure. I want look at these multi-billionaires that have these nice homes. They're constantly worried about it. You know why? They, it's as if they, uh, they have no security. And it's interesting to Jeremiah, they put Palm Sunday up, and they worry about it. But we worry about the littlest things, too. I can remember my father, we would be out in the restaurant, and he'd be scared that we'd be eating the wrong stuff and run into oil. And I had a nice home, and I had oil. And because it's a large store like that, get a lot of credit for it. Well, you don't really get credit for it. People say you buy and you keep your leases. Well, I keep you to a certain place to rent. And I don't want them to have that place ready so they can go to this and do that. And so I have to put some labor pressure on them so that they can just go and get a lot and get a lot of things that they need. I don't have that kind of security. This credit will create So does God answer prayer? Yeah. Is he different God in a different way? You ever had a situation like that? God does it all the time. You usually, what you worry about, some of you can fix it in a year. What you usually worry about never can occur for a year. And the reason why I have, you know, God wants you to be a homeowner. So 
and have money and yet we come to see God by his word in his word in us through the Holy Spirit so we believe the word we do not disobey it so the entire Old Testament though if you look back on it you think that as Paul does in Romans chapter chapter 2 verse 16 he looked at it all scripture look at that all scripture the Greek, all scripture. And you'll notice this word parakle here, P-R-O-C-H-E, parakle. You know where we get that word from. It comes from, what, 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 when you have a, a pencil, it comes from a letter called parakle, right? So this word is actually a technical term for going through everything that goes into a textbook. So what Paul is saying here is that all scripture from the Old Testament is to be recognized as scripture. It is, here's a good word, theonoustos, right here. It means to, it means two, these two words, theo, which is the word for God, comes from the Greek term theon, which is theo, it means it means God. And then the second word, noustos, we get our word pneumatic from the Arabic, right? That it means or that sound. So it means air to breathe. So God breathed is literally the translation. All scripture is literally the breath of God. And trust me, when God breathed into man, he breathed into man. Remember that very creative and creative man in Luke 10 and chapter 10, Genesis chapter 1 and 2 out of the rib? And then what do we do? breath of life, but an interesting breath of life is a genitive of sorts. In this, God didn't pump him up. God didn't say, okay, this guy now has to eat blood so that he's warmer. (laughs) You know, and pump it up. No, 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 no. It's a genitive of life. The source of life is God. There's a breath of life, and God breathed So I had a friend tell me this, that he was pro-abortion, and I was saying, well, I, I don't think Christian teaching does that. I know Christian doesn't teach that. I don't believe that. And he says, well, I can prove that it's okay. And I said, okay, well, prove it so that we understand. And that's the chapter he went to. He wrote a whole paper on it, basically saying that God breathed into Adam the breath of life, inflated his lungs, literally, and he became alive. So therefore, a baby isn't a living soul until a baby draws a breath of air. Then after it draws its first breath of air, it becomes a living soul. And when that when the rapture has not happened in the textbook, then there's a source of very careful and useful grace for it. And it means that God gave him a life sentence. And now we understand from the Old Testament that clearly states that even in the Old Testament's mother's womb, in her father's seed, God knows about it and he gives him life. And of course we believe the old Christian that we can go ham with with different denominations. And the one thing that we are proud of about the Catholic Church is that they are still pro-life. They mess up in a lot of other areas, but one of the things they do is they mess up in pro-life. So, right. Yeah, New Testament. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> Hang on, I'll get there. I get, it, it's, 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 it's the next page. Let's get the little one side over it. Let's get, where's the rock? Where's the stone? Oh, man. All right. Quickly, let me recover from that one and turn over to 2 Peter. Now, remember this, that the word scripture here, bracha, is a technical term. And that technical term, you're going to see, not only refers to the Old Testament term, but the New Testament as well. Watch this. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, knowing first of all, 
that no prophecy of Scripture, there, there's our word prophecy, God. So there is the foretelling of God's word, literally God's word in Scripture, comes from someone's own private interpretation, which means somebody didn't sit down and go, oh, you know what, I, I tell you what I think. I, I think we ought to, let's do this. Let's, let's make that one change. I'll put that on the list and see if it doesn't work that way. But it comes not from someone's private interpretation. Verse 21, for no prophecy was ever produced by what? The will of man. But, here's the process. Men spoke from God as they were what? Carried or borne along or taken along by the Holy Spirit. He's ultimately referring to that scripture is scripture, but here he's referring to the process of how we receive scripture. It wasn't somebody who just said, oh, I think I'll write a few things down here. I read my Old Testament, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some good insight here, and that became scripture. No, the actual testimony was written by men alive from the very beginning. No prophecy ever came for by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were carried, or the old word we use is inspired by what? The Holy Spirit. What we mean by inspired is what God actually breathed into them. You won't find the word inspired used too much, although when I was through one of my graduate seminars, we talked about the inspiration of Scripture. The reason we don't use those words anymore is because, you know, some girl can be down at the beach and she has a warm, fuzzy feeling come over her her and she'll say, hey, I've been inspired, or I was inspired to write this song, or I was inspired to write this lesson. So it's not that kind of inspiration, but it's rather the process from God through the Spirit of God operating within the individual. And we're going to see that not only does God operate within the individual, it's not a dictation theory that God gives you every single word that you are to write down. But somehow there's a conflict between my personality, who I am, and the Word of God that comes together where he uses words that I use, but he uses them in such a way that they're guarded and protected, and so that every word that is written by the apostles and prophets is actually the Word of God itself. So that's, that's why we can compare Scripture with Scripture, and we don't find contradiction that's why we can also read, and there's a whole branch of theology and thought where we can talk about the genre of how the Bible was written. We can talk about how we can read John and John's epistles and uh, the Gospel of John, and we can see the words that are said most in John are what we mean by John words, but that Paul used for Paul to write to him in very, in a very different way. So we can see the differences in personality in people, but it's all controlled by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Yes. Interpretation is an interesting one. Um, for good reason. Because it's just a different way to interpret what was written. <sighs> sure. <laughs> yeah, what translation is this? Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah. It had interpretation. Can you grab me with that? Was that Randy who told you to do that? Okay. Well, here's a great way to do that. Why don't you go to the Red Light Institute that talks about that. Look up 2 Peter, which is the Greek for that. And it's the Greek word apostle, and it has interpretive terminology in Greek. And if you click on the Greek um, interpretation tool, it's in Portuguese. or Because um, I don't think uh, King Theo, King Theon, the monk that used to write the Old Testament, had a Greek name. 
they would not have been able to get out of the way. And I hope that you don't have that with you. See, sometimes words can't carry a point. Or sometimes when you look up a word, you can have a primary meaning together, a secondary meaning together, and a third meaning together. And then you read the complete Hebrew or read the Greek of that meaning, and then it will list the various different ways to take it. Uh, the same way that this word could go to this way, and that all depends upon all the words in the context. So when we're looking at Greek and we're looking at word studies, and words can mean a lot of things, that's why you have to take the whole passage and say, what is it saying in context? What do the verbs mean? What is his argument here? What is being presented? Instead of just saying, oh, it can mean this, this, and this, I choose this right here, number three, oh, that's not a good way to do it. You're actually doing the reverse of what we should be doing, and that is making our point in the fullness of the text and the context, and then coming back and saying, given the context, this right here probably is the better fit. And, or, and look at commentators, commentators who, you know, I got a lot of different uh, commentators, so, but yeah, I, so I don't know that that's wrong, but um, obviously, you have NASB there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. NASB is a good translation. Uh, it, it, is, it is more so on, on, the, on the translation uh, dynamic scale, right? So here's the problem that we face. Not all words have an exact word in the English language, right? So you, you come over here and you have like good news for modern man, right? And it's very, it's not word for word. It, it gives, tries to give you the meaning of the text very loosely. And then as you move across the scale, it becomes a literal, almost word for word translation, but the word for word translation becomes more wooden. It doesn't flow where, very well in English. And the NASB is over here. Okay? Which is what I cut my teeth on was the NASB. In fact, that's what my text is based on here. NIV would try to be over here a little bit. The NIV is the nearly inspired version. <laughs> and then you have ESV, English Standard Version. The problem with the NASB is not that it's not a good translation. The problem is the name, New American Standard. And when America is not held in high esteem overseas, they look at that and they go, I ain't reading no book that advocates anything for America, right? So, but um, Dr. Thomas and a lot of my profs worked on the NASB. Interesting story, you know all that land there around Disneyland? Uh, there was just, just thousands of orange groves down there. That's why they called it Orange County down there. And the, the man who owned all those orange groves got saved, sold all of his orange groves decided to give his money away to the Lockman Foundation. The, and then, of course, they put in Disneyland and all that stuff. But the Lockman Foundation then dedicated the funds to translate the NASB. So I thought, well, what a great story. But somebody just has this kind of wealth and says, I don't need it. I'm going to give it another translation of God's word to help us. Good. Yes. Uh, is the King James, it's, it's the one that fell from heaven on a parachute, and so we know that it's, at, yeah, so there's off, often a big debate, and, you know, so when people talk about the King James Version, and, and churches fight about this today, um, they use only, and some guys will only preach from the King James Bible, right? And I always say to them, which version? because it was translated in 1611, and I guarantee you, if you picked up a 1611 copy of the King James Version, you would have a hard time reading it. Yeah, the new King James, yeah. Well, you're the guy who doesn't think that the New Testament's inspired, so that, that <laughs> So, yeah, the, and the new King James is to update that, but, you know, the only difference here, it's, it's, it's a great translation in terms of the poetry. I mean, the 23rd Psalm, does anybody want to change a word in that? I don't. 
In fact, some of the translators later on did very well at trying to make sure that they kept the beautiful poetry and the rhythm of the King James Version. Absolutely beautiful. And I memorized a lot of verses of Scripture in there. But here's what happened. After this, we found all kinds of scrolls, right? We found the Dead Sea Scrolls, 1948, right? And, and, and there's not major differences, but there are some differences that give us better insight. And in the King James Version, 1611, when it came to the book of Revelation, they didn't even have it in Greek. They had it in Latin. And so they went from Latin to Greek and then translated that Greek into English. So now that we have found other manuscripts that have the Greek, we're able to do a better job at translating. But... The translations there are words that change over time and have their meaning. Because what's, what's a word? A word is a vehicle to a thought, right? I'm trying to communicate to you. So I give you a word, and that word comes to your mind, and you understand that word. So if I say, let your conversation be holy, which is what the King James says, what, what, what comes to your mind? Yeah, the words that come out of my mouth. But actually what it's saying and what it meant in the King James era was let your life be holy, the manner in which you walk. So changing it from conversation to manner of life or walk is not a disagreement over what the text says, but it's a disagreement over how we understand it in English. So in the, in the old English, if somebody was cute, you would say they were bow-legged. Bow-legged, what they? I have no idea. But back in that day, that's what bow-legged meant. It meant cute. Or if you were between, if you were betwixt between the twain. Again, there's that language. Okay, so now, where were we? Yes. So, no prophecy. So this is the process of inspiration. Now watch this, 2 Peter 3.15, look at it. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother, whom? Paul. Watch this. Now, here, here's interesting. This is Peter writing. This is Peter writing, and he's writing about Paul. Count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother, Paul, also wrote you according to the wisdom given him as he does in all his letters. There you have the Pauline epistles. When he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? You got Peter saying, Paul's not an easy read. I got that book of Romans and I started in it and man, I got a lot of questions. Which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destructions as they do, watch this, other what? So now you got Peter saying Paul's writings are the equivalent of what? Scripture. And we're saying that all Scripture in fact, as you begin to understand that passage of Scripture, you're going to begin to understand that every word in your Old Testament and New Testament is from God. It is absolutely all considered Scripture. Hmm? Yeah, somebody help Cliff with that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a great question. How, so you're talking about the people that actually sit around and translate God's word. Yeah, right. Well, it, it shouldn't affect their translation. You know, it, you know, unless they've got an agenda, and, and you'll see later on that some people do, and they'll, you know... That's why I say translations are best and they're done by a committee where they get, get a whole group of scholars together 
and they go through the rules of grammar and then they, they knock out the translation. And when you just have one person doing it, even though he may be very good at languages, you, you should have other people always looking over your work to make sure you didn't make a mistake. Yeah, Eugene Peterson wrote the message, okay? And he's a, he is a, a, a great Bible scholar and a really good at original languages. But there are some parts in his translation that are weak, that should be reinforced. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what it, I, I don't know what he says about that. Oh, does he really? Okay. Oh, in, into their group because they, they see it as more favorable. Uh, interesting, I didn't know that. Yeah, so in that case, that's very dangerous, isn't it? Because you go back to the book of Revelation, he says, don't add to this book. Don't take away from this book, right? So. Uh, I think the Nestle's 23rd Greek New Testament is the best. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, I, I grew up on NASB, but I memorized everything from the King James because that's, that's what you used back then. I love the NSB. I love the ESV. And Gus, some of you have an NIV, but Gus uses the O NIV, which is the older version of the NIV, which was translated in 1985. He uses that version, and so sometimes even though you have the NIV and he's reading from the NIV, you're like, wait a minute, why doesn't it say that? Because the new NIV is an earlier updated translation. So, but if you ever have any questions about the King James Version, just, just talk to Gus. He was there when they, when they, <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> uh, okay, where did I leave off? Okay, so, but if, so Paul here is saying that all words, New Testament and Old Testament, are the very word of God. They're God-breathed, right? That's what the word graphe, and here in this particular text, scriptures, that's our word graphe that is used. Now, because it's used Old Testament and New Testament, it is a technical term that refers to God's inspired word. And it's used 51 times in the New Testament, and every one of those instances, it refers to Old Testament writings. Interesting, God-breathed and also used here in Peter and throughout your New Testament. Now, sometimes, here's what's interesting. Look at this, 1 Timothy 5.18. This is an interesting passage. So it says what? For the scripture says, what's the scripture say? The ox, when he is treading out the grain. Okay? So, you know what that is? That's a quote from your Old Testament. From Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. So here's Timothy's making a point, and Paul is writing to Timothy, and he's talking about the pastorate and those who labor in the pastorate. He is saying, just like the Old Testament scriptures in Deuteronomy, the animal was allowed to tread the grain as he went around in the circle, and he was also allowed to eat the grain. So those who labor in God's word should partake, and part of their salary comes from the church itself, those who labor in word and doctrine. And then he does this, and the laborer is, or worthy, or deserves his what? His wages. Now that is not an Old Testament quote, but you will see that it's used by our Lord in Luke uh, 10, 7. And what makes this text interesting is you have an Old Testament scripture and a New Testament scripture to make a point. Both of them referring as scriptures. And I like this verse because it says Old Testament and New Testament is all scripture. It's all God's word. It's all God breathed. You follow me? Okay. Now, hang on. This is one that always gets people. This is the one that gets people tripped up. Paul, when it comes to the book of 1 Corinthians, is writing, and he's talking about some hard things. He's rebuking the church, 
and he's writing some really stern things, and many of the times when he writes things, he will clearly tell you that this is the word of the Lord. For instance, 1 Corinthians 14, 37, um, he basically says this, if anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I'm writing to you are what? Command from the Lord. So Paul is receiving direct communication and inspiration from God as he's penning the very word of God. Now, here's the difficulty. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 12, I don't have a slide for that one. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 12, he's writing about marriage. And um, so he says, look at verse 10. But to the married I give instruction, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. Where is he getting that truth from? Read, read the text again. What's he saying? I get instruction from who? The Lord? Right. So he's getting it via the Spirit of God, the Lord himself. But if she does leave, let her remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And that the husband should not send his wife away. So back in those days, you could pretty much put away your wife for anything. One of the things you could put her away for is if she didn't give you any children or she was barren. Uh, that was one of the righteous things that um, Abraham did. Abraham could have put away his wife, Sarai, because she was barren, but he did not. He kept her, he loved her, and many times in Scripture, you'll find that example taking place. Now, look at verse 12. But to the rest I say, not the Lord. You see that? Not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, let him not send her away. So if you're married to an unbeliever, let's say you got married, you were a believer, you were unbelievers, and then one of you got saved, and your wife is brushing up against and hating the fact that you are a believer. She doesn't like it that on Sunday morning you go to church to worship, and she'd rather have you take you out to brunch or whatever. And, but she, she's not going to leave you. She's going to stay within the context of the marriage. Now, later on, he's going to say if she's an unbeliever and she wishes to depart, it's okay to let her go. But what do you do with the phrase where he says, not I say this, not the Lord say this, but I say this? Does that mean that that verse of Scripture is uninspired? So what's, what's he saying here? I think what he's saying is this, is I'm not going back to anything that Jesus specifically said, but still I, as an apostle, who receives instruction from God under the inspiration of the Spirit, still give you this command. Make sense? Yeah, absolutely. He, he, and, and, and apostolic authority, is, in this case, is with a capital A, isn't it? Now, we have a very dangerous movement out there today called NAR. If you haven't heard of that, it's the New Apostolic Reformation. There are people out there who say they are apostles, and they have the same authority over the church and have the right to interpret and, yes, even add to Scripture. Are you familiar with it? Have you, have, you he have you heard of the church up in Redding, California, Bethel Church? Okay. I uh, think it's, what's his name, Tom? Bill Johnson. Bill Johnson. Yeah. So, you know, he will literally line people up in two rows, and he will walk down the rows with his hands like this and breathing on people. <sighs> to receive the Holy Spirit. 
That's the New Apostolic Reformation. In fact, there's a good book out on it called New Apostolic Reformation that really challenges what they're saying and what they're believing. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the author. If you Google that, New Apostolic Re Reformation, um, it'll come up. And I, can't, I got a copy of it in my library, but I don't remember the author. I do know this. There's two, uh, a guy and a gal. Um, they graduated from Biola University. And uh, good, really good text. So we have a lot of churches that are moving this direction. So he gave some apostles, right? What do the apostles give us? They give us what? The New Testament. And he gave some what? Prophets. What do they give us? The Old Testament. And then he gave some pastors, right? Hyphenated teachers. Yeah, thank you. Evangelists. Got to put the evangelism in there too. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, that's a nod to Gus. So, and he gave some apostles, prophets, and evangelists, right? Old Testament, New Testament evangelists for the equipping of the saints and the work of the ministry. So, evangelists have a very unique uh, work. They go out and they share Christ with people. Uh, and they usually don't stay long in an area. And they move on to the next area where there's fertile soil and start churches. And that's what Gus has done probably five, six times. Started a church in Simi Valley. I was there for that. Started a church up in uh, Washington in Billingham and uh, still going today. Started a church in Idaho, which is still going today. Then he went down to Arizona and took over an existing church that was a, a real problem church. And so what he did is he won a bunch of people to Jesus. And so when it came time to uh, vote because some people didn't like Gus, the new people who came to Christ outnumbered the old people, and uh, he was able to stay. But it, very different ministry. So the, my gift mix is right here, pastor, teacher. That's, with the, you agree? Yeah, amen. And there, there are times um, I'm like, Lord, why did you give me this gift? I mean, when somebody goes in the hospital or somebody hurts like that, man, I, mean, I really feel it. And I find myself, but, but it drives me to pray. You know, so while I'm walking around the city, I do a prayer walk, and as I'm walking around the city praying, I'm praying for these different people here, but I, all I can tell you is, is that God just gave me that gift to shepherd people, and I, and I don't understand it, but I'm thankful that I have it. Some, some people have the gift of knowledge, that they're really smart, they're brilliant, and, and these are the guys that teach in seminaries, but they don't have the ability to shepherd the flock, and you really get in trouble when you get one of those guys in the pulpit and they just become nothing more than an educator. And what we are supposed to do is look at God's word and put God's word into practice in our daily life. Amen? All right, let me give you two more verses of scripture and then we'll hold right there. First, or uh, John 14, 26, this is the process. But the helper, the paraclete, that is the one who's come alongside the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, this is what he's saying to the disciples. We'll teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So these guys spent three years with our Lord. How are they going to remember everything that Jesus taught them? I mean, do you even, does anybody even remember last week's sermon? <laughs> right? But when you have the Holy Spirit and he brings you into remembrance to help you recall all that I've said to you, that's the process of inspiration. Do you see that? How about this one? John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes. Now, be, be careful here because in your, uh, your Old Testament, and in one sense, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are part of the Old Testament. Well, what, what do you mean they're part of the Old Testament? They're in the New Testament. Yes, but they're, it's a, that's a transitional period where Jesus comes on the face of this earth and then after he dies in the book of Acts begins the actual movement of the church. So when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you, what, into all truth. And the point that I want you to understand is the spirit of truth. So at the day of Pentecost, the spirit descended. 
However, that does not mean in the Old Testament they didn't have the Spirit. Some people misunderstand the Old Testament and they say, well, they didn't have, the Holy Spirit wasn't sent. Well, in what way do you mean that? And here, here's how I tend to think of the Holy Spirit coming. I think of the Holy Spirit coming. He's present in the Old Testament. No question about it. They couldn't do what they did. But think of a, think of a glass of water. Okay, you got to... The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament maybe came up to this level of fullness. That's why you see the word fullness in the Bible. But when Jesus comes, and especially on the day of Pentecost, the fullness of the Spirit comes. So we have the Spirit of God like they had the Spirit of God. But we get to experience the fullness of the Spirit of God that they did not always have in the Old Testament. Not that he hadn't been given, meaning the fullness hadn't been given, but the Spirit of God was present in the Old Testament. Questions? Yeah. It was written in Hebrew, the Masoretic text. It's helpful because Hebrew is written in a language which doesn't, or the, the vowels are supplied by the reader. So when you're reading your Hebrew, like if I was to write the letter look in Hebrew, okay, let's just say in English we say, LK, no vowels. Now, in English, you know that it supplied vowels for the letter look. What the Masoretes did is they came along and they added vowel pointing. They added like full letter holums, they added a siri, they added pathak, they added different symbols, vowels, so that when we read, we understand what the vowels are. Modern day Hebrew doesn't do that. Modern day Hebrew and regular uh, Old Testament Hebrew just gives you the 22 consonants. But that doesn't mean that the vowels aren't there. The Masoretes, who were a people who then moved to the Dead Sea area and collected these scrolls and put them in pots, and they were discovered in 48. Um, that's where it's so significant of a find because we have manuscripts going back a thousand years. It's powerful, amazing. Yeah. Okay, guys. Helpful? Good. Okay. All right. We will. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So it's 830. I'm going to wrap it up in prayer and then um, hang on to your thing because we're not finished with this. What, uh, what page did I leave off at here? If you turn, 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 turn. Um, number two, we are convinced the Bible claims to be the Word of God as we read the Bible. I'll pick it up there in two weeks. Okay, so for those of you uh, who don't have plans, Good Friday is the tomorrow's Palm Sunday. For those of you who don't, uh, not following the liturgical calendar or whatever, it's Palm Sunday. An interesting thing that if you want to know what the Spirit of God did to the disciples in John's gospel as I was studying that on Palm Sunday, uh, chapter 12, I think it's verse 7, the disciples didn't even understand what was happening on Palm Sunday when Jesus was received. In fact, the text says later on, after he was glorified, they understood. It's a good example of the Spirit guiding them into truth. And then Good Fr Friday is next Friday. We have a service here beginning at 6 and program for the kids in here. And then if you are not going to a church or want to join us, we meet in the park at 10 o'clock on Easter morning, and we will have uh, North County Fellowship, Second Baptist Church, First Baptist Church, and there may be a couple other churches join us, uh, joining us, I'm not sure. But Gus is going to be back, and, and he's going to preach an evangelistic message. And praise God, we hope to see some people get saved, huh? Yeah, for, yeah, at 9.30 there's an Easter egg hunt. Yeah, good, all right. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for the certainty that we have of it. And as we learn more and more, Father, may we continue to trust in you. Do not let us doubt. Do not let us disbelieve. Do not let us, Father, be fearful. 
but trust in you and trust in everything that you say because this is your eternal breath written for us. We can take great confidence. It, it, it's as if you were standing right next to us, speaking to us. We, we have an advantage, Lord, that people who even saw you in your day didn't have. We have the completed New Testament of everything that you did and all the epistles and writings given by the Spirit. So may we study your word and may we study it well. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming, guys. Have a great day.